Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Nursing Health Services and Policy Research Colloquium Series. Today, we have a special presentation, um, a bit off our usual schedule, a Thursday afternoon, and, and we're very pleased to have with us Dr. Olga Yakusheva, who is Associate Professor of Nursing and Public Health at the University of Michigan. Um, prior to that, she was a postgraduate scholar at Yale University Schools of Medicine and Public Health and a tenured faculty in the economics department at Marquette University. She holds a PhD in economics, master of science degree in policy economics and baccalaureate degree in applied mathematics. Her area of expertise is econometric methods for causal inference, data architecture, and secondary analyses of big data. The primary focus of Dr. Yakusheva's research is study of the value of nurses. Um, she pioneered a new method for measuring the value added of individual nurses and of nurse education experience and expertise to the outcomes of patients under the nurse's direct care using the electronic medical records. Uh, this work has won her national recognition, including the Best of Academy Health Research Meeting Award in 2014, nomination in 2018. She is currently working to uncover traits and success strategies of highly effective nurses, including education, experience, and expertise, and most recently, practice-informed design thinking and innovation. Dr. Yakusheva's path to nursing science started when she witnessed firsthand the difference that a nurse made in the end-of-life experience of a close family member. Her first collaboration with nurse scientists dates back to 2006, and in 2014, she joined the nursing faculty at the University of Michigan. Today, Dr. Yakusheva is a team scientist who has contributed methodological expertise to many nurse-led research projects on topics such as hospital readmissions, primary care providers, obesity, pregnancy, and birth. Dr. Yakusheva led the design of the Healthcare Innovation and Impact University of Michigan School of Nursing and was appointed to the position of the HIAP director in September of 2019. Welcome, Dr. Yakusheva. We're very pleased to have you here today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you, Andrew, very much. Please call me Olga. I have a look, I see a lot of familiar faces and names in the audience. I feel like I'm at home. So thank you very much for having me. And wow, I did not realize how long that introduction reads. I will make sure to send something more like 150 words next time. But thank you. So I'm here today to hopefully share with you a project that is brand new um, and it's, um, so it's a little bit off, I guess, not a tangent, but a little bit of a new water that I'm just tipping my toes in. And that has to do with machine learning methods, something that I've never done before. But uh, the impetus of this project or the way that this project fits into my research agenda is that I am really interested in the value of nursing. And there's a lot of research that looks at um, different measures of nursing, nursing um, and specifically research that, that looks at the contribution of nurses to patient outcomes. And a lot of this research is, um, you know, getting increasingly more, more sophisticated from sort of hospital, initial hospital level analysis, purely cross-sectional to becoming a little bit more of a, you know, long, quite a few more studies are looking at longitudinal at the unit level. And then I took the analysis down to the patient level, looking at the contribution of, of nurses and the of, sort of nursing characteristics of the nurses who specifically took, you know, took care of the patient to this particular patient's outcome. But this is very new. So uh, what I'm trying to do here is to not so much get at the level of precision between who provides the patient's care and the patient's outcome, which is what I was doing before, but rather look at the um, structure of the relationship itself. So I'm looking at um, whether or not the relationship is linear, nonlinear. So, um, and that has very, very interesting implications. So let me start uh, by, so the title of my study is a little bit, um, it's a typical, uh, typical for economists to ask a question and uh, the journal that submitted it to, they asked me to actually revise the title to take, I guess, the snark out of it and I will, but I'm keeping the title that it is now, is more always better, a machine learning analysis of nurse staffing and hospital readmissions. 
So a little bit of background, I already um, alluded to some of this. Um, hospital readmissions are a significant problem. Um, like a lot of adverse outcomes of, of hospitalizations, they're costly. They tend to repeat themselves in patients and they also create significant morbidity and mortality uh, or contribute to morbidity and mortality. The question that a lot of people are asking is whether or not it's related to quality of care, because it, it is, if it is related to quality of care and not to sort of where the, the, the circumstances of the, um, of the patient's um, socioeconomic, demographic, and social support network, then there's something that hospitals can do to improve the quality of care and reduce readmissions. There, um, there is a significant amount of evidence that um, readmissions are Effect, are a fact of the quality of care within the hospitals, and that uh, stems from the hospital readmission reduction program that was launched by uh, the government now a few years back. And there has been significant reductions in readmissions following sort of the penalties that were uh, imposed on hospitals uh, and incentivized hospitals to do something about their um, discharge process, about their um, focus on readmissions about the coordination of patient's care from the, hospital, uh, from the point, uh, from the last day of the hospitalization to, um, you know, to the patient's immediate post-discharge care and um, longer period of post-discharge care. So, um, but one of the biggest, um, I guess, approaches and biggest, um, most frequently used strategies to improving readmissions, um, especially, especially as it, um, refers to, nurse, to, to nursing care is to improve staffing. And the idea here is that if the staffing in the unit is not sufficient, the nurses, do, the nurses will not have enough time to deliver high quality discharge care or to engage in um, transition coordination activities to, to best support the patient's successful transition from the hospital, uh, from hospital care to um, home-based self care. So the idea is that if, um, if there's more staffing in the hospital unit, more hours per patient, more nursing hours per patient, they are afforded to overall um, care process on the unit, then more of that, more of that care, a larger share of that, of those hours, a larger share of that nurse staffing um, will be devoted and um, will be devoted to discharge, discharge preparation throughout the hospitalization and the last day uh, of hospitalization, thus, thus improving patient outcomes um, post-hospitalization. There is a large amount of literature that better nurse staffing, and by that we usually mean um, both the quantity of staffing, um, such as hours per patient day or nurse to patient ratios, um, as well as sort of the quality of staffing. And by the quality of staffing, we usually mean the quality of the human, human capital um, that's embedded in nurses and that's education experience of expertise. And there's a lot of literature that relates the um, both quantity and quality of nurse staffing with improved patient outcomes. And some of the um, transformational thinkers and leaders in that field are of, co of course, Linda Aiken and uh, her subsequent um, the group that she subsequently built that includes Mac McHugh and um, a lot of health services researchers that devote, devote a lot of time to looking at sort of the value and how to improve the value of nursing to patient outcomes. And some of my fellow economists who, are, um, who um, early got involved in the process of measuring value and measuring the contribution of, nur uh, of nursing to patient outcomes, and that includes my good friend Jack Neilman. Um, I myself, um, as I had mentioned before, moved that area of research forward by taking it down, um, so taking the level of granularity um, with which we study this process, the contribution of nurses to patients from the hospital unit level to the patient level. Um, specifically, uh, so as I'm embedded in the literature, there was a paper uh, by Peter Griffith um, published in 2019 on B&J quality and safety that sort of produced a really interesting um, finding. They looked at the association of um, nurse staffing with patient outcomes, and they looked at it, um, they allowed for the possibility that that association is not linear. So a lot of the previous research, including my own research, looked at that association as sort of the, um, um, like one coefficient in the regression model, which will tell you if nurse, nursing hours per patient day increase by, let's say, one or by 10%, then patient outcomes improve by, you know, whatever, 2%, 1% of reduction in readmissions, right? So um, what, when you look at it linearly like that, what actually happens in sort of in the um, 
computational side of the regression model or the statistical technique is that it averages out um, all of the, it, it, it calculates that, that effect size for an average patient, right? So it's supposed to represent all of the patients in the unit and, um, or all of the patients in all, or an average patient across um, on an average unit if you include multiple units in the same study. And it does not allow to, um, it, it's limited in terms of saying, well, what if, what if there is a difference between what the contribution of nursing is to patient outcomes when there are, when the level of staffing is low and you add one hour per patient day versus when the level of staffing is already high on the unit and you add one more um, hour of nursing care per, per patient day. Does it, is the impact the same? And although sort of logically and conceptually um, sort of our gut will tell us that if there is not enough um, hours of nursing care, if, if staffing is not sufficient, is not adequate for the provision of high quality care, then increasing nurse staffing will have a, should have a larger positive impact on quality and safety outcomes, including readmission. Then if the unit is already properly staffed, then the quality and safety problems may not be necessarily coming from um, insufficient staffing or even um, um, a deficiency with the, the or potential area for, for, for improvement within nursing. And the problem could be coming from a completely different area, right? Processes of care are not sufficiently, um, evidence-based processes of care, of care are not um, being paid attention to within the organization, or the work environment may not be entirely conducive of being able to provide the best, the best patient care. And in that case, adding more staffing really doesn't, doesn't do anything, won't do anything to improving patient outcomes. So what Peter Griffith, Griffith did is he tried to um, sort of get at this issue by instead of looking for a linear association um, between uh, nurse staffing and, rhythm, and, and mortality, he looked at mortality as the outcome. He decided to look at it as, um, as a quadratic cu cu cubic polynomial, right? So that allows, as a mathematical function, it looks like a, like a U shape, right? It looks like a U shape. And with a U shape, you, you are allowing for the possibility of the tipping point where adding their staffing improves outcomes and improves out, lowers mortality and lowers mortality and lowers mortality to a point where you really do like nurse staffing is no longer your issue. That is not where the um, avoidable mortality comes, comes from. And you start adding more additional staffing and it doesn't help and may even contribute to the problem. So when he looked at this, um, uh, when he looked at this um, as a, as a polynomial allowing for the relationship not to be linear across the range of nurse staffing. What he found is that the blue line here is, um, is nurse staffing and the um, dashed orange line is the nursing assistant or what in the United States we call non-nurse staffing. Um, so, um, nurse, uh, so like legal um, LPNs and nurse, uh, nurse assistants in the United States. And what he found is all the, uh, the relationship with registered nurse staffing is pretty monotone and declining. So the more nurse staffing you have, the better mortality, the lower mortality becomes. But the association with non-nurse staffing, this nurse assistance is, is, a, is a curvilinear relationship. There is a range where um, additional, we're adding more non-nurses uh, non to the unit reduces, uh, reduces mortality. But then there is a very sharp um, sort of increase and in hike in mortality that's a, so after, in association with additional nursing assistant staffing. Um, and although Peter Griffith themselves didn't really specifically talk to or explain why this might be occurring, um, there, there is a quite significant a robust number of studies that have found this type of a nonlinear uh, relationship of nurse staffing with patient outcomes before. And some of those studies date back to, you know, to 1998. And so, and the two systematic reviews show that pretty much every study that has ever looked at the or allowed for the association between nurse staffing and patient outcomes to be nonlinear, found some sort of a nonlinear, either tapering off effect or a U-shaped effect. And um, so some of the studies found that uh, with regards to medication errors, errors uh, some, some studies found it with regards to mortality, hospital acquired infections, and even pressure ulcers, an outcome that typically is very sensitive to nursing care. And um, were poor, poor uh, pressure ulcers, high rates of pressure ulcers that traditionally 
sort of attribute it to nurses not having enough time to turn the patients a sufficient number of times or follow the protocol and all of that. Even um, pressure ulcers are um, associated with nurse staffing in the nonlinear, that sort of U shape, where there is, uh, there is first a reduction in the pressure ulcers, and then there is a point where adding more nurse staffing is associated with increasing pressure ulcers. And those studies um, were produced in both the United States and internationally. And then what was really interesting is that um, my good friend Jack, Jack Needleman and uh, his colleague, his colleague she, uh, she, I, I, I believe you pronounce his last name is Shekely, but if, if that's not um, correct, I apologize. Actually, in response to Peter's, um, Peter Griffith's paper in BMJ Quality and, and Safety, sort of took that um, very economics driven approach to explaining this. And they said that this increase in adverse outcomes that's associated with high levels with adding more staffing where um, nurse staffing levels are already adequate within the organization might be a natural consequence of what they refer to as diffusion of effort and responsibility at high staffing levels. So that explanation is basically same as too many um, cooks spoil the broth, right? When there is um, when there are a lot of nurses on the unit, a lot of bodies present at the same time, a lot of people, people are responsible for a lot of different actions, it might be easier to sort of the initial gains from having adequate and sufficient staffing so that everybody could do, could do their part and focus sufficient attention on all of the aspects of all of the aspects of care, those initial gains start being overtaken by sort of the difficulty of managing and coordinating care when there are so many people are involved, um, are present on the unit at the same time and involved in multiple, uh, multiple processes, which allows for oftentimes duplication, missed, missed care because you think somebody else might have done it, and also duplic duplic duplicative care that, is, um, um, that may also not lead to very high quality of care. So Needleman, um, Needleman and his colleague were the first one to sort of throw that idea out there and say, look, there might be this, you know, adding more nurse staffing may not be the win-all solution to all quality and safety pro pro uh, problems when the staffing is already adequate. And they also commented on the fact that it's um, that type of problem, the diffusion of effort and responsibility may occur across many types of patient outcomes and sort of open the door for future research to actually look into this, into this and, and figure out if that might be happening. And that is very important to know that because if, you know, if additional nurse staffing does not no longer improve the outcomes, not only is it um, sort of not cost effective because nursing labor is expensive, but also to put the, the waste of the, uh, the waste of resources that goes into you know providing more than more than needed amount of staffing on one, on one unit results in deficiencies uh, deficiencies of resources in other areas because we all know the healthcare resources are limited. So um, it's very important to know if if nurse staffing needs to be if the, if if there's a certain level of staffing after which adding more no longer helps. And that's so. So, and that's what we um, set out to explore in this paper. So, our goal was to examine the pattern of the relationship between their staff and hospital admissions. And by pattern of the relationship, we wanted to look at what the relationship actually looks like without any a priori sort of without having to um, think, oh, that's it's linear, or can it be a U shape, or can it be a zigzag, or can it be a circle, right? So, we we went um, we went into this investigation. Our goal was to go into this investigation with a completely agnostic um, evidence, sort of evidence-based perspective or a theoretical, right? So we wanted to, our goal was, was to estimate this relationship, examine the relationship of uh, patient outcomes and specifically readmissions with nurse staffing and see what it looks like, right? Um, without humans trying to figure out what it might be. So we wanted to, um, and the goal for the impetus was for this, we wanted to see whether the possibility that additional nurse staffing has diminished in returns, um, returns to readmissions, right? So where there's this um, pattern where readmissions first go down as you add more staffing, and then that might plateau and even start going up as you, uh, as you add, add more staffing, whether that pattern actually emerges from the data without us looking for it specifically. 
and um, we will, and which then, which then will relate to the existence of a tipping point. After each um, adding more staffing may no longer improve readmissions and may actually worsen readmissions. So our conceptual framework the, what, that was guiding our work and a lot of, I would dare say, all of the previous studies of nurse staffing and patient outcomes is the uh, done obedience structure process outcomes model. Um, specifically, it was later augmented by Mitchell. You know, so the done obedience original model, model uh, from 1966, I believe, um, did not incorporate patient characteristics. Um, Mitchell subsequently and colleagues added patient characteristics into the model, right? So the model views patient outcome as the sort of result, the, the um, product of a process of care and the process of care is rooted in the structural characteristics within which the setting and instrumentalities as done obedient explained it with which oh, what, that give rise um, to the process of care. To give it a little bit more rigor, um, because the done obedient model um, was sort of one of the, you know, and it still is, is, is quite qualitative. It talks about the setting and instrumentalities in which process uh, is, is the product in broader terms, giving examples. But we wanted to add a little bit of a uh, layer, um, theoretical layer that allows that, that's a, that is allowed to us by the science of economics. And that the economic theory of production is actually pretty nicely aligned with the Donna Median model. It breaks down structural inputs into labor, capital, and technology. And and the labor, capital, and technology, the three categories describe all of the hospital resources that are being utilized during the delivery of care and the setting in which care is delivered, right? So in economics and the, the way that economists view um, the structural characteristics is as one of those three categories, labor, capital, and technology. Labor input is the human capital, right? This is nurses and other clinicians and other non-clinicians, so physical therapists, um, um, Physicians, physical therapists would be clinicians, non-clinical support staff would be administrative staff, custodial personnel, any type of a human, living human body that is engaged into the process is considered labor. The capital input under the category of capital inputs in economics, um, we sort of categorize everything that's non-human, right? Every, all, of the, all of the resources within the organizations, within the organization that humans used to engage with, with one another um, to be able to provide care. So within the capital input, it, um, we take, we include both facilities, right? This physical structure within which care is provided. We'll look at equipment um, and supplies that um, the labor, uh, different types of labor inputs, nurses and physicians and physical therapists and so on, use in order to be able, in, use in order to, be able to provide uh, care. The, um, Electronic health workers would also fall under the capital inputs. So basically anything, any kind of an organizational structure, quality and safety systems protocols is the only thing that, that is excluded from the uh, capital inputs. And that's categorized under the, category, under the group of technology, the technological input. And the technological input um, is what is the is what the organization establishes as um, the set of care delivery components that form the organization's standard of care. So that would be protocols, programs, um, practice guidelines, as well as the norms within the organization, communication norms, expectations. So, so organizational culture, um, quality and safety systems, processes for care delivery, processes for um, even you know, reimbursement and, and moving through the ranks and promotion and, and all, everything that the organization does, all of the processes and structures that are built within the organization that are non-tangible are considered to be technology. Um, so the definition of technology is all the components that form the hospital or unit standard of care that prescribe how care is supposed to be delivered. All right, so electronic health records even though we call them IT technology, right? And economics would actually be capitalized as a capital input, right? Because it's it's a um, it's a bunch of electronic systems, hard you know, hardwired. So that would be a capital input. But how they're used and how they guide care is the would be the technological input. 
So then obviously under and, and patient level uh, risk factors, um, we'll look at sort of patient's health um, prior to delivery of care that may impact the patient's outcome. Um, and then the production process itself is hardly ever measured and captured. It's, it's, right, it's the mechanics of what's being done, the mechanics of the, of the execution of clinical, clinical care delivery and the patient outcome is obviously what the patient outcome is. So I'm going to skip. I have here. I'll, I'll supply the um, copy of the presentation if for anybody wants. But I, I added here sort of parts of uh, seminal papers from which the, struggle, the conceptual framework for this uh, for the study is derived. So for the empirical measures to measure the structure, um, the labor input, we'll look at. Um, hospital level um, around full-time equivalence and non around full-time equivalence. So we're trying to capture um, labor as, as, as well as we can. We're looking at unit level around power hours per patient day, around overtime hours per patient day and um, various other, um, other labor inputs. For the structure, some of the examples of the structural capital inputs include the size of the hospital, the type of the hospital, um, at the unit level, we include also bed size, number of patient days, and um, other variables. And in terms of technology variables, we um, specifically focus on technology as it relates to the process of discharge teaching or transition coordination. So one of the example, of, no, an example of the variables we include, and I'll tell you more about it later, is the um, discharge model of care, whether or not the hospital and the unit um, use regularly utilize um, one of the evidence-based national discharge trans uh, trans tr discharge care models, such as Mary Naylor's model or Project RED. Um, patient demographics, we have a lot of data on patient characteristics. I'll tell you where the data comes from. And for the outcome, we're looking at readmissions within 30 days. So the goal of our um, methodological approach is to reveal, as I mentioned, reveal the pattern of the association between um, staffing and readmissions as it is without imposing any a priori expectations on whether it's gonna be a U-shape or a zigzag or a straight line um, up or downward sloping, whatever that might be, just it might not be, a, it might not even be a month. So we not, don't necessarily expect it to be like a smooth, any kind of a curve or a function, it could be anything at all. But whatever the pattern is, we just want to be able to see it. So we decided not to use a conventional regression model approach because any conventional regression can only estimate the pattern that you already program into it in the first place. So your regression equation, if you make it linear, then it'll only estimate a linear relationship. If you, relationship. If you make it quadratic, it will only estimate a quadratic relationship. It will never deviate from this. So we'll try to fit whatever you think the model will be. You will try to fit it onto the data that there is. And if the fit, the fit is good or not, not good, it will can just accept or reject the shape that you already programmed into it, but it won't tell you, scratch the parabola that actually is a, you know, like a nest shape or whatever that might be. Um, that type of looking at what the actual true underlying pattern is, is not something that uh, traditional parametric regression allows you to do. So we chose to use machine learning. Um, machine learning is a fully non-parametric technique. In fact, that does not produce an equation at all. All it's good for, um, is, well, I shouldn't say all it's good for. You can think of machine learning as sort of like what people have looked at as a black box. And it is, some people will say it is a black box, but I, um, I actually like to think of it more as, um, you know, those machines where you, whatever the game is, when you drop a ball and then it follows different, different, different pathways and then it lands in a certain slot at the bottom. So that's what machine learning is, right? So it uses a lot of data to first um, derive what, what they say, what, what we call a tree, right? The tree is a bunch of splits down which observations will fall. And each one of those splits will be a particular, um, val will be a value of a specific variable that's important to, important to predicting readmission. So there are thick branches and there are thinner branches and there are really, really thin branches. And then once the tree is derived, so that sort of that machine is built that guides where the, um, where the observations will, will fall, then the same model can be used to predict um, whether an observation a patient is going to be readmitted, just send it down the model and based on what the characteristics, send it down the machine and based on what the characteristics of the observation is, the observation will either fall into the yes readmission or the no readmission um, bucket. 
So for, for machine learning, it's important to have two sets of data, one set of data on which you estimate the tree, you estimate your, your is, it, is it a pinball machine? I don't remember what it's called. So you estimate your machine and the other set of data, which you then throw, you put through the machine to predict the outcomes. So it's fully non parametric and the beauty of it is that it does reveal the pattern of the association, no matter how complex it be. Now the pattern could all be wonky and might be, not be meaningful, in which case you'll say, well, it doesn't seem like there's an association at all. It could be linear, it could be non-linear, it could be anything at all. Whatever is truly in the data, whichever way readmissions are truly associated with um, staff with a staffing levels along the entire range of observed staffing levels in the data, that pattern of association will be revealed to you and you will see it with your own eyes. You won't see mathematical function that describes it, but you will see it with your own eyes. So for our data, we used um, a we used a very large sample of um, a database that we collected from a previous study that our team has completed back in 2019. I think the publication that um, described the trial was um, the paper described the trial and its findings is in JAMA. I think 2020. It was a cluster randomized multi hospital study of a discharge intervention. I won't focus much on what the discharge intervention was. Um, all I, um, I'm just going to note that we did not find intervention um, effective overall. There were some um, margins here and there where, where it helped a little bit, but not much. It was um, a negative trial overall. But it included 33 hospitals. From each hospital, we included two medical surgical units, so it's 66 units. And the two units were randomized to the intervention and control. Um, so the study design was we had a baseline, um, baseline measurement before the intervention started, and we had three phases of the intervention where slightly different modifications of the what we call enhanced discharge protocols were implemented sequentially. And on the control units, on the intervention units and the control units, control units use standard of care throughout. So from that, uh, from that data, we have a large number of um, adult medical surgical inpatient discharges of over 140,000, which lends itself really well to machine learning methods that require large amounts of data. These are, most, uh, these, these are all patients from medical surgical and medical surgical units. We, for our analysis, bro broke the data into 70% learning sample and 30% testing sample. Remember how I told you you need to have a sample on which you sort of figure, figure out the structure of your pinball machine and then the sample that you actually build a pinball, pinball machine and use it. And, um, okay, so the primary outcomes and exposure, our outcome was 30 day all cause, all cause same hospital readmissions coded as one patient had at least one readmission within 30 days um, post discharge and zero if uh, the patient did not have a readmission. Um, the primary exposure. So we wanted to look at the quantity of um, unit nurse staffing, right? And see how that relates to, um, how that relates to readmissions. So based on the fact that Peter Griffiths found differential effects um, or different relationship for registered nurses and non, um, for nurses and um, nurse aides, we broke initially nurse staffing and in, in broke, broke it down into two categories. We looked at um, registered nurses and um, unlicensed nursing personnel. And then we further from our from some of our own previous work, we knew that nurse staffing um, for registered nursing hours, additional hours mattered, whether they were regular hours or overtime hours. So we um, then further broke it down into regular and um, overtime and non-overtime hours for registered nurses. We combined, uh, so nurse staffing was reported monthly by each study unit for, um, so then we had a top total of about 1,200 um, 1, unit month observations, and that might be more interesting for people to who are um, into estimating sample sizes. So we had pretty significant, sufficient power to do these analysis. Now for conceptually, we, so we combined intervention and control units and what allows allowed us to do so, even though intervention units had a different discharge protocol, we used their intervention or we conceptualized our intervention as a 
different technology, right? It was a technological variable that we also controlled, not controlled for, but we also included in our study model to figure out, um, to figure out the relationship of staffing with readmissions while accounting for the simultaneous effects of all of those other variables, including other types of nurse, uh, other types of staffing and um, other capital inputs and all of the technological inputs, which included the fact that on the intervention units, there was, um, there was a different discharge, discharge protocol, discharge technology and three of the state, uh, three of the phases. So some of the um, measures um, or and descriptive statistics, these are in green are the primary exposure measures that we're looking at around non-overtime hours per patient day, around overtime hours per patient day, and non around total hours per patient day. We, because it was important um, from the conceptual perspective to look not only at the quantity, but also at the quality of nursing care, we included measures of quality, the proportion of BSN prepared nurses on the units, proportion of, of certified nurses, and so on. And we controlled for, these are just some of the select characteristics, but we also controlled for hospital-wide labor inputs both RN and non-RN labor inputs. Some of the patient characteristics are pretty typical um, patient sample, large and pretty typical patient sample, about 12% um, readmission rate, which is not, you know, which is well within the range of what happens um, in hospitals in the, in the United States. Um, a pretty unremarkable, distribution of all of the other patient characteristics. So we have we have a nice, more or less representative patient sample. We can't say it's representative and I'll maybe talk about it during the Q&A. Um, the hospitals that, that were included in, the, in our study were all magnet hospitals. The study was funded through ANCC. So all of the hospitals had magnet, um, had magnet designation. So we can't say it was representative, but the sample itself is, is pretty unremarkable, large and unremarkable. So for statistical analysis to implement our machine learning methodology, it's, it's agnostic to the point where you don't even include variables in the model, right? So the model is never, you as a researcher, you have no input in what the model looks like. So we fed our machine learning um, software all of the variables in, in the data set, there were about 140 variables that were specifically collected by the study to fit into the structure process outcomes model. So then we use random forest recursive feature elimination to select variables in the model. And I said, we use, so we use the feature, the feature selected variables in the model. So some of the hyperparameters parameters for those, for those who are interested, 500 tree, uh, trees, minimum node size of six. Uh, we did do some tuning and the node size of six was the optimal one. And to see the relationship between their staffing and readmissions, we uh, use partial dependence plots. And I'll show you what, um, I'll show you in a minute what they are. So partial dependent plots is basically the line. So what, it, what the model does, because you don't know what, there's not a mathematical function. It's, it's a, a pinball machine, right? But what you can do is you can, Vary, um, vary the levels of nurse staffing and then re reprocess the entire data set through the pinball machine and see how it changes readmissions, right? So then you can plot the predicted readmissions for various levels of nurse staffing. So that plot of predicted readmissions is what we get as an output of our model. In terms of model selection, I'll just focus on one thing that um, our model predicts really well in a learning sample, but also pretty well in the testing sam sample. You will notice pretty good specificity, a little bit lower um, sensitivity and positive predictive values. The overall area under the, um, under the curve for the testing sample is 0.711, which is pretty typical of machine learning uh, models when they're applied to readmissions. So these are our main results. So what you see here is the, the three plots, they show the, the partial dependence plot or the pattern of the association of, diff of the three nurse staffing measures with readmissions. So the first plot is for the association of regular non-overtime RN hours with readmissions. So readmissions are on the left hand, is on the vertical axis and the number of hours is on the horizontal axis. So you will see the number of hours, the um, average is 
somewhere here about 6.9. And then um, this is the frequency distribution of um, patients exposed to different, uh, different levels of nurse staffing in the unit. And this is our predicted readmission rate for uh, various levels of nurse staffing. And you see the pretty, and uh, these are the confidence bounds around the readmission rate. So you will see that uh, the readmission rate as sort of Peter Griffiths showed and a lot of other um, people previously to him showed and, and Jack Needleman had um, sort of theoretically proposed as, um, as diffusion of effort and resp responsibility, the script does display that, right? So originally at low staffing levels, readmission rates are about 12% and then they go down to about, um, I think 8.1, 8. 8. I, I cannot exactly remember it. I, I have this in the paper. So the bottom here is, a, um, is significantly lower than the higher, than, the, um, than what the readmission rates are in the, um, units of with low level of staffing or when patients are exposed to low level of staffing during their stay in the unit. But then it starts to increase again, right? So past the minimum point, past this tipping point, there is a pretty sharp increase in readmissions as um, staffing, as the hour, nurse hours per patient day are increased on the unit. While everything else is kept as um, at the level, all the other variables are kept at the same level as they were observed in the sample. Um, we see a similar check mark for overtime hours, although you will see that um, sort of the minimum, so there was pretty low number of um, overtime hours in this magnet organizations. On average, I think we had less than 0.2 hours of um, RN, overtime hours per patient day. And clearly more overtime hours were strongly associated with higher rates of readmissions. And this is for assistive personnel, for non-nurse staffing. The last one, the last uh, panel here is for non-nurse staffing. And again, you see that um, adding more uh, nurse assistive uh, assist personnel it reduces readmissions at first, and then it start, starts to increase them. So we observed that sort of U-shaped pattern associated with diminishing returns, tapering, tapering off, whatever you want to, uh, whatever you want to call it. We saw it across all three. Uh, types of nurse staffing. And we did a very large number of sensitivity analysis. We kept on observing a significant, um, clear, clear, clearly U-shaped and significant relationship between staffing and readmissions. So the summary of the findings, the partial dependent plots were U-shaped as we, I just um, showed, I showed you visually, showing readmission risk first declining and then rising with additional staffing. The tipping points or those points associated with the lowest amount of readmissions were at about 6.5, um, 6.95 nursing non-overtime hours per patient day, 0.21 nursing overtime hours per patient day, and about 2.91 uh, non-nursing hours per patient day. And this pattern, as we had already um, sort of talked about this, was consistent with diminishing insurance to nurse staffing. So potential implications for policy and practice, uh, diminishing returns, if they, do, if, if they do occur, they're consistent with economic theory and uh, they can be avoided. Economic theory again suggests a number of ways that diminishing returns to any one particular labor input can be avoided. And all of those approaches, they have one thing in common. It, we have to find out, so once adding more nurse staffing alone doesn't help to improve outcomes, we have to find out what the right balance must be between uh, nurses and um, nurses and other types of labor physician nursing assistants, as well as other types of resources available that need to be provided by the organization to sort of keep high productivity and avoid those diminishing returns for the growing nursing staff. So it's all about balancing. Um, so you can't, I guess, the takeaway point is that you can't just be plugging holes um, in your quality of care by ad with adding more nurses. You have to have a multifaceted strategy that not only that not only allows for adequate, sufficient, and and optimal nurse staffing, but also make sure that nurses are properly equipped and um, properly resourced to provide the best care they can. Obviously, the study had limitations. Causal inference is limited. It's an observational study. 
machine learning um, methods do not produce um, sort of a functional form that you can test for um, limitations of for reverse causality or omitted variable bias. So it is an observational study. We have generalizability issue, issues because it's magnet organizations and we did not have um, methodologies not been developed yet. And we're working on this to look at the interplay among the three nurse staffing variables. So, so far we just looked at partial effects of each one of them while holding others constant, but we don't know what happens if you increase nurse staffing while at the same, uh, non-overtime staffing, while at the same time adding more additional um, non-nursing personnel. We will do it in the future. Study strengths that I told you about in the beginning and the conclusion. And the takeaway point is that incremental quality gains from additional nurse staffing diminish and may reverse at high staffing levels. And to avoid that, accompanying investments in infrastructure and human, um, and human resources might be needed to support further performance gains from um, quality and safety gains from additional nurse staffing. So thank you for, um, I think this is all I got. I'm happy to take some questions. I know there's not a lot of time that I left, but I guess I had a little, little bit more details than I had expected if I felt like I had to tell. Thank you. Thank you so much. We do have some time for questions. And if that's okay, I, th I think we should jump right in. Um, and happy to defer to uh, other members of the audience today rather than jump in myself, although I certainly could. So I'll give people just a second here, see if there's anyone who wants to jump in first while they're thinking, okay. I, I do have some questions of my own while people are thinking and, and, uh, and jumping in themselves. I wondered about, um, so this was, these hospitals were magnet hospitals, is that right? And mm -hmm. magnet hospitals are recognized in part for their quality of nursing. And I was looking at the frequency plots and wondering whether, um, I, first of all, I was somewhat surprised to see the variation in staffing even within a, a set of hospitals that are, um, you know, presumably invested in nursing or achieving quality through nursing. Were you surprised by that? And do you think that on the edges of those frequency plots, maybe does that impact your estimate at all? And are you curious about um, kind of pulling in hospitals that maybe aren't magnet or, or trying to kind of fill out the observations on those peripheries in any um, in any sense, or am I thinking about this all wrong? You are thinking about this very, very correctly. Um, I will answer your first question first in terms of the variation. Um, if, you, if you go back to this graph, so what machine learning does is that it sort of predicts what would have happened for the entire range of staffing levels that were observed in the data. If you look at the frequency and distribution, very low staffing levels below five. Can you see my cursor or not? Okay, so very low staffing levels like below five and very high staffing levels above 10 are increasingly rare. They're almost so, and these are patients, right? So very few patients experienced low, uh, low levels, levels of staffing or high level of, levels, levels of staffing. The, in fact, the interquartile range is displayed by these two um, vertical dashed lines. So the majority of the sample is right here. Even here, there is you can see it, um, a U shape, but definitely not something that would um, shock you. I don't think if you you know if I took that interquartile um, range and stretched it out. So the, yeah, there does seem um, for, these graphs are pretty dramatic. But if you, you know, the majority of the sample are right here. So there's not a lot of variability in staffing, not as much variability of staffing that patients are actually experiencing. And the other question, would I love to do it in non-magnet organizations? I would. I, um, it's depending, right, obviously. So we, funding this work is, um, is the first prerequisite for doing it, for doing it right. The study was, um, this is sort of a piggyback analysis that was prompted by Peter, um, by Peter's paper and then subsequent Jack Needleman's um, sort of suggestion, suggestion of, you know, um, diffusion of effort and responsibility. So we just wanted to look at it with the data we had, but that definitely is a limitation. And yes, I would love to have a lot more hospitals. 
And then I, I see there are two questions, but I think I just have one follow-up question. Maybe you could answer it in, in one sentence, I hope. It, it seems to me that if the base of this U is close to maybe where the average or most patients are, it seems like the, the base of this U, the inflection point, tends to be within that interquartile range. Is this an indication that in most cases we're staffing appropriately or within that target? Granted, there's a variation, but, um, or is that not a fair interpretation? So I, yeah, I think I have to, the conclusion here, if you were looking at it, um, is definitely we're, definitely we're staffing most mostly appropriately. There's a little bit of this upward. So we do plug holes with nurses every once in a while, but not a lot. Now, The, I guess the point is that we just shouldn't, right? <laughs> I mean, we did definitely, we plug into holes more with nurse overtime staffing, because this is where you see the minimum, like at the bottom of the interquartile range and patient outcomes are not improving. And that's just a waste of resources. And they could, could potentially even be getting worse, right? We're just looking at readmissions. Readmissions are not particularly sensitive to nurse staffing. If we look at other outcomes, that's another limitation of this work. Okay, I have so many questions, but I, I see two hands. I see at the top of my screen a question from Dr. Jeremy Kahn, so I turn it over to him. Um, thank you so much. That was just an amazing talk and elegant analysis. I've been a fan for a long time. We, we met like almost a decade ago at Academy Health, and you probably don't remember me, but it was really a pleasure. I'm a big fan. Um, I'm really intrigued by the hypothesis of diffusion of responsibility, which we are seeing other places in healthcare. You know, one of the things I study is ICU telemedicine, which is essentially an extra set of eyes on patients. And we have found that there are scenarios where mortality goes up when you add ICU telemedicine. And our, our main hypothesis is this notion of diffusion of responsibility, but we've struggled to test that hypothesis to, to figure out if it's causally related. Um, and I've wondered, I, I'm wondering about your thoughts on a competing hypothesis, which is that if you're a hospital and you know you have a quality problem and your only response is to throw money at it by adding nurses, it's just a marker for you being terrible in other ways. And maybe you could get at that by looking at the work environment, but it's an important distinction because one mechanism is the causal mechanism and one is sort of a, this is a proxy for something else. So I'm wondering what your thoughts on that alternative mechanism is. Is, is this just a proxy for being a terrible hospital with a few degrees of freedom and how to serve your fixture quality problems? Um, and if that seems reasonable, how might we go about sort of teasing out those two mechanisms? Yeah, so I don't think you could, you could do it very well with uh, observational methods. You would need to have designed some kind of a, um, trial right to see to see if that's um you know at what levels adding more nurses no longer helps right and that would need to be randomized and and make sure that the conditions for the trial enough to eliminate those alternative explanations which have not been you know i think it would be pretty hard to fund this study that's the answer like the million dollar question that nobody will ever fund <laughs> Yeah, do you think controlling for work environment would help? Because I noticed that was not one of your confounders. So if you had a good measure of work environment, do you think that would help tease that out? And might that be another follow-up? Well, I'm so sure it would help. Yeah. It would it would help, definitely help. But there would be somebody else who will say, Well, I know you're controlling for work environment, but there are other things that it could be that could be causing it. Right. So it's you know, th this argument that this is not a randomized controlled trial and the evidence is coming from observational research, it's common to every observational study right. out there. So yeah, I definitely a big, big, um, big limitation to this work and any other, um, any other observational study, right? So regression analysis isn't much better at this than machine learning is. We're including a lot of variables just like regression analysis does. So in terms of sort of causal inference, we're not superior here. What, what this, I guess, the value added of machine learning methodology is being able to look at the association completely flexibly and see what it looks like um, with all of the limitations in the background and all of the potential interpretations in the background. You just got to be aware of that. Yeah, well, thank you so much again. I think the analysis is just incredibly elegant. You've done great work. Thank you. Olga, I see it's one o'clock now, but I think Dr. Bircher has a question. Do you have 
a minute for one more question or? I do. I actually have until two, so. Okay, <laughs> we'll keep you that long, but I'll turn it over to Dr. Birch. I would like to uh, thank Dr. Khan. He, he messaged in the chat that Plinko, I think is the name of the game you were referring to uh, in Plinko? technology for machine learning. So there, you can tuck that one away. <laughs> All right, Dr. Bird. I'm also a prices right fan. Oh. <laughs> right, right. Uh, two, two quick questions. Can you go back to your uh, slide where you listed nursing characteristics? Mm -hmm. This one? Yes, and the, um, the line labeled percent certified RNs, mm -hmm. uh, what does that refer to? It refers to um, specialty certifications. So okay. not APRN, that refers to specialty certifications within the, uh, within the nurses, um, what is it, within the regular nursing license. Okay, so uh, certified oncology nurse, for instance. Yeah. Okay, uh -huh. um, and the, the second question was, um, in looking at nursing staffing, uh, does that include all nurses assigned to that floor? And that means bedside and nurse educators? Or I, what, was, was there anything other than non-bedside nurses included in, in that staffing model, as you might expect for a magnet hospital? So these are direct, direct care nurses. OK. So from what I, and again, um, I have to apologize um, for my ignorance here. I'm not, I'm not a nurse. So in my understanding, direct care nurses would be the bedside nurses and not sort of unit managers unless they provide care. Well, yeah, what, I, what I'm thinking of is a, a kind of um, empirical model in which you have bedside nurses uh, then maybe a nurse educator, or maybe a primary nurse, maybe a charge nurse. And under those circumstances, at least in some ICUs, things that are, that might reasonably be delegated to the bedside nurse or sometimes delegated to the primary nurse or yeah. somebody other than a bedside nurse. And that, that provides a mechanism for diffusion of responsibility so that nobody gets the, the dish surge instructions before the patient leaves. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. I'll ask my clinical, uh, I'll bring this up in my clinical team meeting. Thank yeah, and, and uh, I, I would vigorously encourage you to um, develop models that look at the interaction for the nursing hours as compared to non-nursing hours. Uh, in a magnet facility, you would not expect to find unreasonable reliance on non-nursing personnel for nursing functions. Mm -hmm. However, the further you get from a magnet hospital, uh, related what to, to what to Dr. Khan said, um, the more likely it will be uh -huh. that something like discharge instructions may be delegated to non-nursing personnel. And the, the, the economic analogy that uh, is locally applicable, if you start to replace steel workers in a steel mill with common laborers, uh -huh. you pretty rapidly encounter a problem because there's right. a knowledge set that you have to have in order to make the mill work. Yeah, even in our data, the majority, if you were, if you looked at sort of the most overused type of labor based on relative, relative to the tipping point, that would be non-nursing assistive personnel, non-registered nurse assisted, assistive personnel. So they are, yeah. So if hospitals are plugging the holes from what it shows in our data, they're plugging them with nursing overtime, but primarily non-nursing assistive personnel, non-registered nursing, not a RN. On our end, okay. On our end, that's what I'm trying to say. And, and I guess it, I, I'm wondering where do you, so non RN, this is non LPN hours as well. Are they accounted for uh, somewhere in, in the unlicensed or nursing aid well, or how do they, how do they fall? So, in here? 
So registered nurses are accounted in registered nurses regular non-overtime and overtime hours per patient day. All of the other nursing, uh, nursing labor, LPNs, nurse aides, um, they are accounted in non-RN hours per patient day. So the, these are what the three variables that we have there. There are these three, they're all measures of nursing hours per patient day. These are registered nurse, non-registered nurse, and the registered nurse is further, further broken down in the regular and overtime. I see. Okay. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Great. Well, we've had a few people slip out, I'm sure, just to get to their next appointments and whatnot. Um, I'll check with the remaining members, though, see if there's any additional questions um, for Olga before we adjourn. All righty. I'll take that as a, a satisfied uh, <laughs> group of constituents here. Thank you all for your attention. Um, <laughs> I see a message from Haley here thanking you. Uh, and please. Nice to see you, Haley, too. I saw you. There she is. <laughs> so do keep an eye out for our next uh, talk, which is another noontime presentation. Uh, actually, it'll be Dr. Matthew McKee. Q, who was uh, cited earlier in this presentation, and so he'll be joining us from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, thank you, Olga, for your time today. Really enjoyed the presentation and uh, looking forward to continuing the conversation sometime. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Good to see everybody. All I'm right. going to log off now. Very well. Thank you.